let's let's dive in here. Like, what do you think is actually if if it's not blood glucose, if it's not glucose, um, which I think we've established, and then you and I have talked about also studies from the 1940s. I think Walter Kempner, I think the the white rice study where he fed yeah. people white rice and yeah. sugar, and they lost hundreds of pounds. You know, the diabetes is cured and reversed, so that yeah. they can eat. You know, uh, more a uh, more uh, a more varied diet when they're done. So like giving people pure white rice and sugar caused a resolution of diabetes. So that's a separate thing that we don't need to get into. But what do you think actually causes diabetes for people? Yeah, if you said this thing to your medical exams, they would have probably thrown you out, right? They would ask yeah, yeah. you, hey, Paul, how do we cure diabetes? Feed them more sugar. <laughs> They'll think you're joking or something, but that's what the studies show with humans, right? Um, so there's a drug on the market which is, is approved, but it's not very famous, but it's, it is approved that it's in the States and most other countries. It's called ACPMOX. Uh, a, C is in Charlie, I, P is in Paul, I, M is in Mary, O, X is in X-ray. Look it up. It's basically a minor derivative of, of niacin, of niacin, vitamin B3. And just like niacin and niacinamide, its main effect, admitted, you know, public, publicly proposed mechanism of action, it's the inhibition of lipolysis. And when you give this drug to people with type 2, diabe type 2 diabetes, their triglycerides drastically lower, their free fatty acids drastically lower, their blood glucose lowers not, not long after that. It may take a week, but then after blood glucose eventually lowers in the presence of still existing obesity. So so something is, what's going on here? Why, how can a person with, with type 2 diabetes can, can be brought down to normal blood sugar levels and normal um, lipid profile uh, in the presence of still you know morbid obesity? So it means that the fat that is circulating, that's the most reliable explanation based on the mechanism of action of a CPMOX, is doing something to the cells to prevent them from utilizing glucose. And that's something yeah, was uh, defined, uh, I think, initially in the... 1960s by a uh, gentleman named Randall, and it's known as the Randall cycle. And the Randall cycle says that there are only two macronutrients at any point in time, actually in general, that the cell can metabolize for energy. One is glucose, the other one is fat, right? And then even the glucose, people say, well, what about protein? Well, even protein can get metabolized to glucose and then, you know, through that pathway, but still, but glucose and uh, fatty acids are the two terminal macronutrients that, we, that the cell can oxidize. And the Randall cycle says these two nutrients compete for access to the cell's metabolic machinery, and they have an inhibitory effect on each other depending which one is present there in a relatively more abundant concentration. So if you give more fat, then basically the fatty acids through the process of beta oxidation, uh, they lower something known as the NAD to the NADH ratio. In other words, they're going to increase your reductive state. They increase the amount of NADH. And the NAD to the NADH ratio controls how well the enzyme pyruvate uh, dehydrogenase works. And that is the rate-limiting enzyme, uh, assuming all everything else is healthy. That's the rate-limiting enzyme of, of the metabolism of glucose. So if you have a lot of fat, if you're oxidizing a lot of fat, this puts a break on the metabolism of glucose and... Uh, but it's, it's basically, it's a point of entry into the mitochondria. The glucose will still go through glycolysis, and the end product of glycolysis is two molecules of ATP and pyruvate. Now, pyruvate sits there and waits for the pyruvate dehydrogenase to pick it up and metabolize it further, put it through a Krebs cycle, the electrotransport chain eventually meet oxygen. But if that enzyme, pyruvate dehydrogenase, is not working, pyruvate accumulates. Now, because the cell needs a certain amount of NAD to the NADH ratio to function, in other words, if that ratio drops too low, the cell can die. So the cell says, okay, I'm, I'm building up too much NADH. What can I do to get more NAD? And the cell says, well, in this emergency situation, since I cannot get to oxygen, which is the oxidant that can oxidize NADH back into NAD, what other oxidizing agents do I have around me that can do this trick? And that is pyruvate. So pyruvate acts as the emergency oxidizing agent for NADH through an enzyme called lactite dehydrogenase. So pyruvate oxidizes NADH back to NAD, but in the process becomes lactate. And coincidentally, all the people with diabetes, all the people with insulin resistance, all the people with cancer, cardiovascular disease, etc., they have higher than, norm, higher than optimal levels of lactic acid in the blood. That demonstrates that there is an impediment of, to the metabolism of glucose. Now, uh, Inhibition of pyruvate hydrogen is not the only thing that can cause lactate to rise. Just as we discussed, metformin can do it, but, but how does it do it? By inhibiting another step. But still, it inhibits one of these steps, and you're going to get a buildup of lactate because the metabolic precursors are going to build up, and eventually pyruvate will build up, and that results in a buildup of lactate. So 
The, so th these studies demonstrated that, I mean, Randall's, Randall demonstrated that you can actually control the cell's metabolic flexibility by providing relative overabundance of each one of these nutrients. So that means that if you, let's say, let, if we assume for a second that the diabetes, the inability to oxidize glucose is basically caused by oversupply of fat into the cell, then anything that, that we can do to either limit the supply of fat or increase the relative abundance of glucose relative to the fat should have therapeutic, therapeutic effects. The studies you, with, with, uh, right, or, or, or with white rice you found confirm that. The studies that I sent you later on like the one pound of uh, candy sugar daily on top of the normal diet restored fertility, even in morbidly obese men, I think that also confirms that. Uh, the drug ACPMOX, which actually, so it doesn't increase glucose supply, but it limits the supply of fat. So the over, relative overabundance of carbs will still be there. So it does the exact same thing. So we have plenty of aspirin, by the way, a uh, very, very famous study gave people a massive amount of aspirin, massive according to current standards. It used to be using much higher doses back in the day, 90 milligrams per kilogram. That means somebody that's that weighs 200 pounds will have to consume 9 to 10 grams of aspirin, and they did give these to people. Morbidly obese type 2 diabetic people, uh, 9 to 10 grams aspirin daily. After two weeks, complete restoration of insulin sensitivity and blood glucose and, and the lipid profile in the presence of remaining morbid obesity. So, so they managed to cure diabetes while these people were still remained fat. And it's when they stopped the treatment, then basically the symptoms slowly returned. What does aspirin do? Well, it's another well-known lipolysis inhibitor, but it also has an anti-inflammatory effect, which means it's probably going to end up in re reducing cortisol, which is also known to be higher than optimal in diabetic and obese people. Um, the salicylic acid metabolite of aspirin is a direct inhibitor of the enzyme 11 beta hydroxysteroid hydrogenase type 1, which means it will directly inhibit the synthesis of cortisol. And if you Google 11 beta HSD1 inhibitors diabetes, 11 beta HSD1 inhibitor of obesity, 11 beta HSD1, whatever you, disease you can come up with and, and proceed that search with 11 beta HSD1. In other words, the overabundance of cortisol is behind as a partial cause of diabetes, obesity, and many other conditions. So aspirin by blocking excessive, by reducing excessive cortisol, reducing inflammation, and reducing lipolysis, managed to fully cure these, these people's diabetes for a duration where they were taking it. Did not cause lactic acidosis like metformin does, right? Um, and in fact, the people felt energetic. Uh, I think it improved their mood as well, uh, which is commonly low in people with diabetes. That they, Some of them, I think like 30% have depression or something like that. So, so it's we have multiple pieces of, indif of, of, of evidence independent. By the way, they didn't they didn't cite each other's research, which tells me that these people were not influenced by each other's work. They discovered these things independently through different pathways, which shows that the oversupply of fat, whether it's through the diet, again reliable method of causing diabetes in animal models, right, or through over or through a, a higher than normal lipolysis, which can happen under stress which can happen if you don't consume sufficient amount of, of uh, uh, carbs in the diet because it's insulin that actually keeps excessive lipolysis from happening. Um, if you fast, which is another thing, which is going to raise cortisol and adrenaline and, again, fl flood the blood with uh, free fatty acids. So all of these things ultimately lead to a state where there is an overabundance relative of fatty acids. And then, um, you know, um, I've, I've argued this with other doctors to say, okay, so hold on a second. Um, why does this so, – so if we lower this and the diabetes disappears – so, um, you know, but but um, I think the argument is, okay, so what can we do to cure it? Because when we stop these interventions, basically the, the symptoms return. And I'm saying, well, as long as the stores, if the fat stores contain overabundance of fat, and the majority of that fat is polyunsaturated, whenever these fatty acids flood the bloodstream, you're going to have the exact same condition. First, oversupply of fat relative to glucose, and also the inflammatory effect of these fats by, you know, by the, uh, you know, uh, uh, prostaglandin and the leukotriene n pathways, these things by themselves can actually aggravate in some cases even cause the diabetes. There are studies with animals showing that if you inject prostaglandin directly into the animals in sufficient amounts, you can cause diabetes. Actually type 1 diabetes because the prostaglandins apparently in sufficiently high amounts can destroy the beta cells of the pancreas. Um, so there's plenty of evidence demonstrating that the fats and the inflammation is what directly causes the diabetes. There are studies that show that if you can reverse somehow this obesity, basically you're curing the diabetes. And there are studies showing that even without reversing the obesity, if you limit the effect, temporary effect of these fats that we are carrying or getting from the diet, then you basically don't have diabetes, at least temporarily. It has nothing to do with the blood glucose. In fact, you should be aiming to, to raise the blood glucose by providing more blood glucose, maybe, and then you may have a therapeutic effect. And this was known as far back, I think it's like the 1890s. There are old studies that I can show you that Ray Pete quoted on his website from, um, 
some hospital in London where basically they were they were treating people with high doses of sodium salicylate, which is just another ester drug of, of kind of like a similar to aspirin, and the oversupply of massive amounts of sweet tea. So sweetened with sucrose. And the British love their tea, so they were drinking gallons of it daily, sweetened, and these people were fine, even type 1 diabetics. So that was... That was amazing. Thank you. I know that was kind of technical for a lot of the listeners. I'll just try and summarize it. And basically, we can backstep to where we're, we're actually getting close to the roots of diabetes. But the idea is that excess lipolysis, excess free fatty acids in the blood trigger the periphery, whether it's the muscles, the liver, the brain to become insulin resistant. We know yeah. this. We know. I mean, one of the things that we can even measure in humans is what is the, the NEFA, the non-esterified fatty acids in the blood? What are the free fatty acids? And when you're doing ketosis, when you're fasting, if you're limiting carbohydrates, you will see the free fatty acids go up. And that's a physiologic insulin resistance response. It's not the same as a pathologic insulin resistance, but it is going to raise cortisol. And that, as Georgie talked about on previous podcasts and a little bit on this one, when you're fasting, when you're doing ketosis, you will raise 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, which is going to lead to excess cortisol. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you are triggering these sort of stress mechanisms when you limit carbohydrates. But ultimately, it's the excess free fatty acids in the blood that cause the periphery to be resistant to insulin. That is insulin resistance. That is diabetes. 